G'day guys, um, this is on oxalate toxicity and some other strategies we can use to mitigate um, and sort of the what actually causes, you know, real causes and stuff like that. Obviously the plants do not want us to eat them. So a number of plants have used, deployed the strategy of producing oxalates that slowly kill off the organism that is attempting to consume them. Anyway, so let's look at the screen. So this is oxalate metabolism. So yeast, so yeast infections. So if you get, if you're on a high carbohydrate diet, you're going to be more prone to yeast infections because, you know, pretty much you'll end up with bacterial overgrowth sometimes and a whole lot of other things. And it goes through this pathway. So, so a number of these are enzymes. Anyway, so does vitamin C. And pretty much excess amounts will produce oxalate. Oxalate foods as well, like spinach um, uh, and many of the, and, uh, you know, things like... Uh, soy and many other things are very high in oxalate then you got ethylene glycol now exposures it's stuff that they you know in, in uh, antifreeze so if you're sort of exposed to sort of any antifreeze that will turn into oxalate in your body um polyester um as well sort of stuff so if you're exposed to fumes or whatever that is the potential so so does alcohol and and obviously gelatin is a, um, a potential but the important thing here is while gelatin can go all the way through here glycine coming here and go that way because you know sometimes we talk about glycine and all that and it has um, value glycine in the body, but it also can go down this pathway, potentially, and so can gelatin, potentially. But you do need lactate dehydrogenase. Okay? So in order for this to happen, either here, or here, you pretty much need to be either consuming quite a lot of carbs in, or foods that will increase lactate production or be deficient in taurine. As we know, I've discussed this before, taurine will push pyruvate and lactate it'll prevent in a sense at pyruvate you could actually go back to glucose in a sense because through lactate de dehydrogenase you can go either way you can actually go back to to producing glucose or you can push it into the Krebs cycle and oxidize it and limit lactate production now, how does that work? Well, our favourite molecule, taurine, will basically force excess lactate into the Krebs cycle, limiting lactate availability for, you know, to cause any issues. So on a species-appropriate diet, which you, you will have a certain intake of taurine naturally, you will be able to limit this problem. So it's only on a, on a, when you limit animal foods, you limit taurine, you increase lactate. So, you know, this doesn't happen if you're on a species appropriate diet. If your protein intake from animal food, because that's just gelatin connective tissue, we talk about the actual tissue of the animal. 
then you're not going to have this problem. So you need lactate um, for that to happen. So you need to basically push pyruvate down the lactate pathway. But if that doesn't happen, it's not going to be an issue. So keep that in mind because a lot of people talk about, you know, gelatin and they talk about glycine and they talk about, um, you know, that hydroxyproline and all that. But not an issue as long as you're eating species appropriately and you're not putting in other things that have the potential to increase lactate. So keep that in mind. Um, so the... The other things that are important is that we need to understand is that when it comes to oxalates, we want to bind oxalates with calcium. This is why I talk about people, I say that we need calcium in our diet. It's important, especially when you're dumping oxalate, you need calcium to bind that. But the problem is you also want to not, um, not have a lot of free fatty acids in your gut, if you've got a lot of free fatty acids that are being unabsorbed, they can bind in the digestive tract with um, uh, with the calcium and create this insoluble, like a soap, a soap-like type. I forget the name of it, but what it does is it, dec it decreases the amount of calcium in the actual gut to bind oxalates which is really important. So even if you're, let's say you're dumping and you're going to be pushing them out of the gallbladder and trying to push them out of, you need calcium to bind them. So if you're not absorbing it because it's being hijacked um, by fats that are not being absorbed, and a lot of people have got fat malabsorption issues and that can actually make things worse. So I'll just... And stop the sharing for a for a sec so I can make I can make these points. So if you're pretty much if you're um, not binding oxalate, it will actually then get through the digestive tract and cause these problems. Now, why isn't that happening? Because you've basically got low bile salts. See, bile salts. If they're too low because you've got problematic, you know, gallbladder not functioning properly because, mm, oh, well, many years of being on a vagoon or a vegetarian diet and not getting enough taurine, not getting enough choline that are required, plus uh, phos phosphatidylcholine is also required for bile production, plus B6 is also required. It's sort of a secondary thing, but it's still required um, in there for the for the taurine synthesis as well. And as a consequence, if you don't get this, or you're not eating enough foods that have got cysteine in it as well, methionine, you're not going to produce sufficient um, taurine. So, which is really important for that emulsification. Um, as well of the bile, so it actually, because bile salts made from taurine are going to be more, uh, you'll get a bigger quantity of it, um, and that bile, those bile salts will deal with the, um, the free fatty acids in the gut, which, you know, once you digest fats, they, they, they are basically denatured in the stomach like proteins into amino acids, and then the, these things are absorbed and recombined by enzymes in the body into the different things that we require, um, you know, whether that's used for energy or structural material or stored away for a rainy day in the fat cells. You know, all these things um, need to be managed, and so you have to break them down into smaller bits to absorb them. The problem here is not enough bile salts, then we've got a problem. And so, you know, a lot of people come onto the carnivore diet in the early stages. They come too fast. They transition too fast. They don't get fat adapted. They don't sort out some of their underlying issues like gallbladder issues. Um, and then they start suffering some of these symptoms. And, that, and that's another problem 
um, that actually can be exacerbated. There is the other thing is some people are, have methylation issues as well, like myself. Um, so there you, you know, your B12 and B6 are a big player there as well. And choline is the other one where it also helps with bile salts, but choline also plays a big role um, through that secondary choline betaine pathway for methylation and really oxalate really stuffs up methylation you know, in that regard. So that's another thing that actually happens. The other thing oxalate does is it depletes B6, which is important as part of that primary methylation um, pathway. You know, you really need B6. Also for taurine production, you need B6. So you you get a double whammy. So you're affecting um, bile synthesis and you're affecting methylation as a consequence. Now, B6 is also required to break down oxalate. So, you know, as you can see, it's all, you know, it's it's all, it's a vicious cycle that you can end up in because one is actually causing deficiencies of other things. And if you're not eating species appropriately, you're not going to get the stuff, the amount of nutrients you need to be able to function properly. Now, I'll just minimize, get rid of that, that image. And we'll go into, I'll just reshare my screen. Now, obviously, you know, yeast infections can also cause some of these problems um, by rapidly increasing. And that's, again, SIBO, um, poor stomach acidity. And I've made videos on stomach acidity and how to fix a stomach issue and stuff like that. Again, the key nutrients, taurine plays a big role. Um, so, does, so does basically, um, you know, uh, chloride. That means what you find in salt. So these things and eating species appropriately and limiting uh, plants also will help improve that. could be a H. pylori issue. We may need to take more taurine because it can actually deal with H. pylori. Also, we may need to use the Ruteri, which is the, you know, the supplement that I recommend. And if people go and check the videos that I've got in the, the microbiome um, playlist, um, you'll find you'll find all those details out there about the routine and stuff like that, or you can go into, um, on the, onto the Discord site, Bart's Discord, and talk to Necro Kitty and discuss about the protocol that uh, we worked out. And she's actually made a nice list which people can go and check. She actually put it into, she implemented it to be more precise, and. Uh, we were able to, re well, she took my advice and she was able to resolve her gut issues that were quite protracted and problematic. So um, so you can get a lot of insights on the, and I do encourage people to go there. Now, at some point in the future, I will make a video for this. At the, at the current point, I do encourage people to go to Discord. That's deliberate on my part. It may annoy some people, but if you want the information, you need to support the community. You need to support Bart, me, and many others who are actually doing hard work to provide this information. And I don't think a few minutes of your time in the in a day to go and seek that information out and support um, the Discord um, is too much of an imposition. I mean, just think of it. If you had to organise to go to a doctor and all the tests and all that, how much time would you spend there? You're willing to do that and cough up some money, but you're not willing to basically support us. Well, you know, you want the information? Support us. Um, that's why I've done that. Um, and I don't apologise at all. So don't be so selfish in a sense. Now, I need to share my screen to go on to the other parts. Okay, so taurine. This studies about, you know, um, heart issues and the protective effects, stuff that I've, it'll be for another video and there's a few other things, other ones when I do my cardiovascular ones. So we're not going to look at the structure or anything like that, but I will take a bit of a squeeze just here to show you the importance of taurine. 
tissue types, brain, developing child. Look at the difference. The requirements for a developing child or an adult. Quite a lot, isn't it? Very much so. For the heart, quite high as well. And to deal with a heart that may have health issues, you may need a bit more. That's your standard. That's why, you know, we have therapeutic doses and we have the stuff from, you know, if somebody's healthy, you get it from the animal foods. If you're not that healthy, you may need more. That's why we go for the high doses. Okay. You know, the liver, because it's detox pathways, as I said, methylation, um, and the detox pathways, which choline and, um, you know, the primary um, methylation pathway. And also detox pathways require both choline and taurine in the liver in phase two. So skeletal muscles, yep, very important. That's why people um, in, you know, there's, there's a requirement there. But look, when you look at um, eye health, quite a bit, retina, quite a bit. Look at sites and platelets. And that's, that's humans. <laughs> Obviously, rats require less. But I did notice rats really require a lot for heart health. And only when we're actually dealing with heart issues do we actually require similar levels. So that was quite interesting. Um, and even, yeah, like liver, about 50% more. So that was interesting. So there are, you know, physiological requirements in different animals, different species, which are slightly higher or lower. So when we actually look at the synthesis, follow that up. Okay, so methionine, as I've said, cysteine, methionine to get to taurine. So you've got magnesium there, homocysteine, that's B6. So to go, these are enzymes, you're going down these enzymes, okay? B6 is required there, B6 is required there, B6 is required there. And then there is cysteine in this sort of, sulfonic acid, you know, so, and that's why we call it a sulfur amino acid, um, like taurine. There's, again, and this is um, uh, dehydratase, um, so it's just in sulfonic acid, uh, de oh, sorry, decarboxylase. Yeah, because you're, you're taking off a, a, um, uh, 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 One of the groups, yep. Anyway, so there are these sort of pathways. One is dependent, and even this one is dependent at this stage, is dependent on B6. So you can see B6 is really heavily involved to get to taurine. So this endogenous synthesis. So if you're a vagoon, you're going to be deficient in B6. Simple as that. And if you're under eating protein, you're going to be, you're probably not going to have enough methionine and cysteine. So you're going to be struggling to produce enough taurine. And it probably explains a reason why a lot of these children from vegan mothers have, um, 
a lot of these sort of issues, um, so to speak. Oops. So when we're looking at foods, um, amounts, that's 100 grams. So in ounces, that's 3.53 ounces. So these are different studies. That Those numbers in brackets are for the studies. And these are the milligrams. So they can, they vary. Um, as you can see, raw has a bit more um, uh, broiled. Once you cook it, you lose a bit, but not massively. Um, it's not like hanging the animal up and all that. Obviously, uh, if it was freshly slaughtered, remember these are of commercial um, animals. If it was freshly slaughtered, it would be probably higher. Um, again, this is really interesting. The dark meat, of, the dark meat of a chicken, when it's cooked, it actually you get more. For some reason, in a in a raw chicken, it's slightly bounded, and it's with I can't remember the compound now, um, and so you don't get as much, which is quite interesting. So cooked, um, the cooked part of the chicken, the the dark meat, you know, the your drumsticks and stuff like that, are going to have far more. Um, the light meat, which is the breast and all that, raw has a bit more, um, cooked has a bit less. Again, the same thing as the beef. Um, but the difference is quite messy for the cooked drumsticks. Mm, yummy. It's like four times or five times, five times um, uh, what you get from beef. And that's only the drumsticks. When you go for um for for turkey, the dark parts, the legs and stuff like that, whether raw or roasted, you're still getting quite a lot, far more than any of the other birds. Um, I think emus quite high as well. There's a couple of that you know uh, that are quite high in that regard. Uh, veal cooked has more the same thing with with pork you'll get more um lamb they didn't actually include i don't think they actually include other than the raw one similar to beef you know in the amounts pork has more taurine um so does ham, salami. Salami is even cured salami. That's from beef. And then there's the... Another type from pork and beef, and they've got... Apparently it's a combination, slightly less. You know, bologna, um, turkey. So that's another variety. You know, tuna, very similar to um, meats but white fish which i sometimes do consume white fish they're pretty high they're cooked even higher what becomes available but this is the big one muscles really bloody high so i know um hello kitty she basically uh i've encouraged her to cook um, and she makes her own soup and all that, muscle soup, and she enjoys that. And, uh, yeah, it provides you. That's just three, three and a half ounces. And look at the amount you're getting, you know, seven ounces. And, you know, you're getting close to nearly one and a half grams. So these are different varieties of oysters. So that's quite low. This one is very high. Up to you know, the ones that we have in Tasmania here are also pretty high. The variety, um, I don't remember the North American ones exactly. Uh, again, things like clams, 
are also pretty high, as you can see. The canned stuff is slightly lower. Obviously, processing, you're losing something. Octopus, again, very high. Scallops. I've actually got some in the fridge. I need to... Um, I want to cook them soon. So they are really, really high as well. Uh, squid. Milk varies, varies. You know, it's much lower in that regard. Yogurt's a bit higher. That's some low fat with peach in it, the plain um, uh, the plain that's low fat. They don't, they haven't provided here like a full. So yeah, don't know. Ice cream, extremely low. I'm disappointed in that one. <laughs> God, <sighs> can't justify my ice cream on the on the taurine intake. Oh well, I'll have to find some other some other um excuse. <laughs> Make up some bullshit to justify it. Anyway, let's get on. And that's what you get from pasteurized milk. So it's quite interesting that there are different levels. Now, I don't know whether they're putting in something in, the, in this variety. Don't ask me. Don't know. So as you can see, most of the sources of taurine are in animal foods. You know, you will not, you will not find. There's trace amounts in the plants, um, but it's so small, it's minuscule, it's irrelevant, more or less. That's one way of one researcher characterised it in one study. It's it's pretty much irrelevant. It's not. It's like not getting anything, like zero. You still get a bit, but it's trace amounts. So then choline foods, what are we looking at? And these are important because they do play an important role in bile synthesis. And bile plays an important role in being able to bind the fatty acids, get them, um, get them absorbed and leave the calcium alone to bind oxalate. So... So when we're looking at, you know, you'd probably have to have about 500 grams um, or you're looking at nearly 18 or well over a pound of salmon to or well over a pound of uh, chicken or well over a, a pound Of pork, the eggs are the, the big ones, you know, just one large egg. So you want to get to what they call the 550 mark. You're looking at nearly f about four eggs will give you um, the RDI, but uh, I usually say go for higher, for double that, about a gram. Um, so if you go for six eggs, which is what I usually consume nearly every every night, I usually get a, six, a, 30, a 30 pack of eggs. Now, the other, the other food is liver, obviously. And so as you can see, just from the six eggs, I'm nearly at a I'm nearly at a gram. And we'll just go for my favorite, which is pork, plus one fifty two point eight. So just six ounces. I'm I'm gonna definitely I'd starve if I only ate six ounces of pork. So I'm going to be definitely getting more, but I can 
easily with six eggs and pork get, you know, because if I'm consuming, I'd be consuming about 12 minimum. So... So this is just one meal that I'll have in the evening will give me this amount. Now, beef does have a bit more than uh, than pork, so it'd be you know at least one point two grams easy. So I do have a sort of a genetic thing as well, um, so I require slightly more than the the five hundred and fifty. So this actually covers me quite well. And if I don't have any any eggs, I usually have supplemental. So or if that's why it takes me ages to get through the supplemental, because most nights I do have eggs and I love eggs. Fried in particular. <laughs> I'll be honest about that. Fried or poached. Um I don't mind them hard boiled, but it's yeah, I, I did that for a while. I just uh, eventually I got over it. I can't believe that that guy that used to, an old geezer, 88 years old, used to consume 25 eggs a day on average and just used to munch on hard-boiled eggs all day. Uh, bloody hell, that'd be hard. <laughs> I can tell you, it would be hard, you know. So, actually, sorry, beef is slightly less than pork. Uh, it was chicken, that's right. Chicken, that was the, the higher one. And, you know, shrimp isn't too bad as well. Now, obviously, when it comes to, as you can see, navy beans, you know, when it, and there, you know, the bioavailability is, a, is in question as well. Um, milk, yeah, you know, you'll get a bit, but it's not, it's not massive um, from dairy. You know, it's primarily these other animal foods. And you'd have to eat quite a lot to be able to get anything substantial from broccoli and stuff like that. Like, you know, we're talking about even to get to the, those levels, you'd have to have something like uh, nine cups of uh, broccoli. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd be struggling let alone the distension, and the, the stomach distension or trying to push it through, yeah, it wouldn't be very, very comfortable in that regard. So I'll just quickly cover. If you go right to the bottom, they usually give you the, um, this little. And meats. So as you can see, beef liver. So the livers are going to be the highest. So occasionally having a bit of liver through, um, you know, I don't recommend a lot. Um, people that have got my, some of my genetics probably can tolerate more. So it depends on the genetics as well. Uh, a growing child um, may, you know, want to have small amounts uh, every day or every second day is going to be less of an issue if they crave it. It usually means that they want more nutrient density. They are growing and they require more nutrients. So it's what people did in the past, pregnant women and uh, growing children. And obviously you're not going to feed the child the same quantity you feed an adult. The requirements are different, small amounts, but uh, you're providing nutrient density for a growing body. Anyway, just thought I'd cover that. Now, B6, very important. Very, very. As you can see, long-term deficiency in B6 can lead to skin inflammation, dermatitis, depression, confusion, convulsions, and even anemia. We know because within the primary methylation pathway, it has a big, big role. And also with folate and B12, and also it does play other roles with iron metabolism. But I'm not going to go, that's for another video. Let's just cover this. 
otherwise it'll end up too long. As you can see, salmon is a very good source, can provide large parts of your requirements, and that's only six ounces, and you're nearly there, just a bit over six ounces is required. Uh, chicken, again, the same. That's fortified um, nonsense with a lot of anti-nutrients and many other things. We'll think we'll give that a miss. Um, 12 ounces um, will give you pretty much or three, 320 odd um, grams will pretty much give you anything, all the B6 you need from, as you see, the animal foods are just packed with it. Again, probably 13 ounces of steak, easy for most people to do, um, will pretty much give you all your requirements of B6 for the day. Now, obviously, if we've got oxalate dumping, we will need more. You know, as I said, we're not ancestral. We're not living like ancestral people. And, you know, we we do require more. If we lived as ancestral people, it'd be less of an issue. Uh, we wouldn't have accumulated all the oxalate but we did a lot of inappropriate diets before we got to our species appropriate diet we've accumulated a lot of this sort of stuff and yes that becomes an issue b12 another important element obviously clams you know off the show um you can store from these heaps in you know in your body uh, again, tuna off the show. Seafood is really high. King crabs, you know, you, to any, you look at any parts of um, a seafood. That's why I say, you know, somebody who's on a vegetarian diet could do some crustaceans and some seafood and actually get all the B12 they need. You know? So, you know, sort of pescatarian type approach with dairy and all that and, I'll give you an example. So there's your oysters. These are cooked Pacific oysters. You know, zinc, heaps, copper, manganese, selenium, iron, vitamins, B12. Look how much you're getting. Massive. And if you're on, you know, you don't really have to worry about riboflavin because you'll get it from the milk. It has heaps. You know, some of these other things are in dairy, so you don't have to worry. The biggest problem is you're not getting enough of this on such a diet. That's that's the big um the big issue. And this gives you good iron levels as well. And that's just three and a half ounces. You know. You can go double that, seven ounces or plus um, oh, three ounces. That's only three ounces. Actually, even less. So if you're looking at like iron, seven ounces would cover all your iron needs for the day. Just, you know, just for those who want the metric, 
about 200 grams nearly. Animal foods are packed. And that's from, you know, if you go for oysters, you don't have to necessarily go for oysters. You can go for other things. So cooked blue mussels. This will have a... Good level of selenium. Iron's not too bad. A bit lower, but still not too bad. Eight hundred and B twelve, eight hundred and fifty per cent. I think that would cover most people's requirements <laughs> way over. Yeah. And that's three ounces. You know, you could do an ounce of muscles every day. And you you wouldn't have a problem at all. As I said, um, even people doing what I call a vegetarian, animal-based vegetarian diet, which is dairy, eggs, and seafood. Like, you know, if they don't want to eat fish, they can eat some of the crustaceans like mussels, oysters, and stuff like that. You get heaps of those additional things you can't find in the other foods. So you can make it a viable option for those who are hell-bent, or there may be cases like people that may have had a tick in, um, you know, they may have been bitten by a tick multiple times. They may have some sort of anaphylaxis to red meat and they still have to go through a, a process of desensitization. Some of those people may want to look at seafood, eggs, um, dairy as an option um, and some white meats as an option as they desensitize themselves. So, you know, play around, guys. You don't have to limit yourself to one food, you know, and say, if I can't eat that food, I'm not going to do the diet. There are other options to get those nutrients, and you still need those nutrients in that regard. So the other one, selenium, which is very important for glutathione, because that's the other thing with oxalates, and it tends to overuse B6, B12, I mean, B6 obviously plays a very important role in reducing the amount of oxalate in the system. So it degrades it. But B12 is also playing an important role and glutathione in methylation and also detox in the, the um, uh, phase two detoxification um, as well with glutathione. Selenium is a very important mineral for that as well. I know it's important for muscles and joints and, you know, hair and thyroid. Remember Hashimoto's disease, you know, because if you look at it, the thyroid, it's full of receptor sites for iodine and selenium. Two things that I make sure that I get in my diet and not from Brazil, but um, nuts, which is bound anyway, with full of anti-nutrients. Now you know why I like yellowfin tuna, because it's a good source of selenium as well. Oysters, really good, and I do consume some oysters. Piggy, I mean, probably 120 grams. Um, six ounces will give you 150%. 80 micrograms, I usually target about two, two, three hundred. Um, so I get more than enough. In that regard, animal foods, you're not going to have a problem with selenium. You're going to get plenty. The other ones have to be fortified. <laughs> and most of this stuff, like wheat pasta, it's bound. It's, you know, chelated. You know, you're not going to get access to it. I, you know, it's a joke. It's got anti-nutrients which bind it, so you can't even access it. And plants depending on what the soils are, is dependent. Where 
with the animal foods it's a very different thing because you can actually recycle and keep some stuff in a lot of animals are pretty good at it because they need it we're not as good because we evolved in more richer selenium soils it seems so we've got a bit of capacity at the kidney level but not as good as some other animals so it's probably because you know and you can go right down to the bottom uh, of any of this. I'll put these in and you can oops, and you can go to foods high in. You don't want to go over the, well, technically I have to recommend you don't go over 500 because that's what the RDIs say, that it's to toxic. There's studies out there that beg to differ but look i do recommend that as as a safe thing um if you're getting it through the food and you're not su supplementing it i think that the body's able to say well there's too much so the metalloproteins at the at the interior wall will basically say well we won't take it up i think the body's smart enough to do that i think it's only a problem when you supplement selenium that uh, you could potentially get into toxic levels. So you can go through that. And you can look at different foods and all that, and you can actually decide, you know, these are the foods that I like. What are the, What is their content? So you can go through this. You can select the food and then go through and check all the different minerals and stuff like that and whatever, and, uh, you know, customise your own sort of diet. You don't need me to tell you. You don't need somebody else to tell you. Use this tool here nutritional ranking tool go through work out um, stuff and make sure you're getting enough of certain nutrients it is important that you know we get enough of these nutrients in which will help reduce the um this problem you know so And the other thing is, as well, lactobacilli bacteria also help in reducing um, this problem. But what do we do in our smart, intelligent, um, current world? Well, the stuff that we get coated, as I've always said, as we come out of mummy's birth canal and we get coated with lactobacillus, mummy knows best, and what do we do? Then we decide to eat foods high in glyphosate, which mimic antibiotics or behave very similar. That's why uh, Monsanto's has a patent out on its antibiotic effects. So people that are eating plants that are glyphosate um, sprayed are basically pretty much getting a bit of low-grade antibiotic every day. So that and then antibiotic use uh, um, occasionally will send will reduce your lactobacillus, which is another, there are a number of strains in the lactobacilli that are important in degrading oxalates. So there's a lot of things that we do in our lifestyle that actually undermine. This is where some of the fermented foods and kefirs and stuff like that do have a benefit in producing the, in, in growing the sort of strains that we need that will reduce um, uh, a lot of the oxalate and stuff like that in in terms of absorption, production, you know, and all, also, you know, your certain derangements in the system can be a problem. So if you're eating the proper nutrition and you've got the bile, that's critical, work, your gallbladder working properly. So if you've got oxalate issues and you've got a bile, if you've got a gallbladder issue, it, you really have to get onto ox bile supplementation until you can fix the gallbladder issue. Over time, with choline and with taurine, it will improve emulsification. It will improve bile flow, which eventually will break down a lot of that sort of stuff and actually allow it to, you know, to work properly. You know, sometimes it can take a bit longer in particular when you get a bit of sludge and as it's called bile sludge 
And so it's not only localised within the gallbladder, but it's in the ducts as well. And that can create a bit of issues, a bit of pain and a bit of discomfort. Um, I usually say to people, lie down and rub under on your left side where your pancreas is and just rub it slightly. And also on the on the right side where you basically your, your gallbladder is and sort of rub that also, um, not violently, but, you know, um, right under your rib cage and allow it to sort of, it's like really sort of a like a light massage and allows it to function a bit better and and over time with the right nutrition we'll get it to flow better and function better and these things will improve and it's you know we've done a lot of damage to ourselves over many a moons and it will take a bit of time to heal with the proper animal based nutrition and clear this stuff out in the long run I know a lot of people sort of will go back to the crotch, the crutch of saying, oh, I'll grab a bit of, uh, you know, I won't do the citric acid. I won't, you know, I won't bother. I'll just eat a few um, high oxalate foods to stop the dumping. And I'm not against doing that occasionally, but don't do it. But at the end of the day, you have to bite the bullet a bit. And we don't want like massive, like prolonged months on, um, you know, dumping. We want to slow it down so we can allow our bodies to heal and recover from the assault. But long term, you want to, you know, d go through these cycles of dumping and clear this shit out because it does cause problems. It causes problems in the heart, in the soft tissue. So it will actually cause damage to in your kidneys to the nephrons it'll actually cause problems in the liver cause neck um you know in the lungs and many other parts of the body um oxalate will actually cause problems and cause fibrosis and a whole lot of other health problems we need to eliminate the stuff you know so that needs to be the focus because we have to get it out of our system Long term, we'll be better off for it. If it's out of our joints and all that, we'll be able to walk better into old age and we'll have less stiffness, less pain pain in our joints, in our backs and stuff like that. I mean, I've shown you videos where in bone, you know, you see all these crystals and all that. So we have turnover of, of, of cells every seven odd years. And if we do put some of these things into practice that we do, over time, we'll clear this stuff out. And in the long term, we'll be better off for it. Is that in that regard? I know for, you know, this is less of a problem for younger people because they've had less accumulation and they've also got better mitochondrial health, which means that they can actually deal with it much better because of the extra energy, their system works better in eliminating the problem as we get older we sustain mitochondrial damage a lot of health problems and a lot of issues and we're coming from a weakened position with a lot of health problems and then we get this on top and it's discouraging it's it's annoying um and it's uncomfortable and painful and i understand because i've gone through it myself i you know i had pretty much two years where i suffered quite a bit of this sort of dumping episodes and stuff like that, you know? And so more or less now, I seem to be beyond it. Um, I've had some minor things uh, that I've noticed um, and they've sort of subsided. So there's probably still a bit there that is still cleaning up. So it's not completely one. I'm not 100%. I'm not claiming that. But uh, I'm on the right path. I'm I'm beyond the the worst part. I don't have the those a lot of those problems where before, you know, that's the other problem that um uh, that oxalates can actually also cause is things like diarrhea and constipation. It's because you know of a number of these issues that they cause in the gut. So there's a lot of issues that can also cause certain levels of, of stress as well. So there's 
and a lot and some derangements in the microbiome. This is where taurine plays a bit of a role in helping as well in trying to regulate things a bit better. So it's it takes time, and you know, I know it's it's hard if you're at the early stage going through it, but it does get better over time. I can tell you that. I sort of got a bit disheartened myself. I'm, we're only human. And when you're actually having these sort of really bad symptoms, it can be discouraging. I just kept putting the citric citric acid down and and stuff like that. And when I, when I ran out of it, I went for the lemon juice and the... Um, the sort of the 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 the, the, uh, the apple cider vinegar and stuff like that, you know, I threw everything at it, um, in a sense. But I realised that actually maximising those nutrients is really important. I did take a for a while a period. I did take a um, a B six uh, supplement as well. So that that is one thing that I did because sometimes you. You know, getting a, you know, so and get the right one, which is P five P. Um, so in that, the sort of the more proper one, you know, the the B vitamins that I actually re, um, talk about on iHerb that I've shown before, those those ones have the right the right type. So, I'll, but also the um. That that's the type that you wanna you wanna get. Um, I'm just can't pronounce it at the moment. It's a hard one to pronounce. <laughs> I always get it wrong because of my dyslexia, so I'll give it a miss. But you know what I mean. So if you can get get yourself a, a B6 supplement, that will help you um, degrade oxalate as well. So you know, keep at it, and eventually you will get over the hump. Um, Obviously, some people may take a bit longer because they may have still underlying gallbladder issues that they're trying to resolve. That's the big one. for That was a big one for me because it took me some time for my gallbladder to sort itself out because I had gall sludge and I was just getting small amounts each time and creating all sorts of, you know, let's say stomach, well, gut gut upset issues and stuff like that <laughs> but eventually i got over that sort of sort of period of time but it was uh, sort of a number of months that was problematic and you know luckily it actually happened through the the early parts of covid and i wasn't working from home at the time so it meant it was less of a problem toilet was close by and it was less of an issue, but uh, I don't know how I would have managed at work, to be honest. Um, so uh, some people can get worse effects, and I was one of those people. So just keep that in mind. Um, it's not an easy. Some people it will be easier. Some people have less. It's probably because I consumed quite a lot. I mean, remember I was doing um, spit for those. I wish I hadn't done that low carbohydrate sort of heavy plants um, period that I did. Um, so that sort of, because I was putting in 100 to 150 grams of spinach every day, and that's just too much. So I, was, I put massive amounts of oxalate. Um, so, yeah, crazy stuff. No wonder I actually ended up in five years with four kidney stones. You know, it's just... But this is the problem, that there is a lot of misinformation in in the low-carb community, and I was desperate to find a way to heal my heart and deal with things that... Uh, um, I tried every, a lot of things. So, and like a lot of people... Um, uh, we did consume quite a lot of plants, <laughs> thinking that they were healthy, you know. But unfortunately, it's uh, cost us a lot of angst, um, uh, in our carnival period.
you know. So anyway, I hope this information sort of helps people to sort of get a, an idea of how to manage oxalates and stuff like that, some of the strategies and some of the sort of uh, nutrients they need to have, you need to have in your diet and some of the drivers as well that are that are going to be causing some of these problems. So anyway, take care and that's it. And if you've got any other questions, please leave them in the comments. Um, it may give me an opportunity to generate additional content in regards to oxalates for things that I may have not thought about or I may have not myself suffered because there can be other, um, in particular with women, there are there, there can be a number of um, varied issues that I've heard about but I haven't really looked into. Um, so there may be certain certain things there are issues that some people get with their bladder as well and that's both men and women um an issue and in that and, and in that case obviously getting the getting the citrates in is really important it's just not enough to say well we get these nutrients we'll throw in the um you know the extra calcium we'll throw in the uh, the B6, we'll make sure we get the bile salt. Citrates are very important as well because we do want to degrade these so they're not irritating tissue in the body as well. So that's an important thing. But if I haven't covered something specifically or do please put in the comments so I can actually then look into the um, those other aspects that people may have concerns in regards to oxalates, and then I can do a, um, a follow-up video covering some of that sort of stuff. Anyway, that's it. See you.